Hey everybody, it's uh, John uh, W. Comerford here. So pleased to be with uh, the audience um, for uh, alternative uh, venues for jazz. Invited on by uh, Gail Boyd uh, to come and share uh, some of my uh, experience, strength, and hope for jazz. To borrow a phrase, and excited to uh, to do that. So I thought this was initially actually going to be a, a conversation or discussion show, but I found out through a little bit of research and through a nice email from Gail that uh, it's actually just a solo, <laughs> it's a monologue. But um, in the spirit of uh, conversation and discussion, which is all important for, uh, for the art form, um, there are a few questions. So I'm gonna riff off these charts and uh, we'll see where we can go in the next uh, you know, 28 minutes uh, moving forward. So the first question, um, which I loved because it got me to uh, reflect and really, uh, you know, dig on some music in my mind's ear uh, is uh, who was uh, the first jazz musician I remember hearing? And I'm going to take that to be live, as in live in concert. And I'm 55, so I kind of came of age with, with the music and was fortunate enough to grow up in New York City in Manhattan. So, you know, everything was like a subway ride away uh, or a cab ride away to go hit anything in the village. But I didn't really know much about the art form. And uh, I, at the tender age of about, I don't know, maybe 15 or 16, uh, had um, kind of entered, you know, through I think a lot of uh, people in my generation in the Gen X, beginning of Gen X, um, through improvisational rock guitar, you know, exposed to improvisation on records and with uh, different groups over time, whether it's, you know, Jerry Garcia or, uh, Dwayne Allman, Eric Clapton, et cetera. And um, had a feeling, I think, from knowing musicians that there was a deeper well that was going on. And then um, one day uh, a friend um, at my high school invited me to go see a show in the village, a jazz show. And I was like, yeah, let's do that. And I walked into the Village West and I saw Ron Carter and Jim Hall um, turns out I found this out like a year ago, which much to my freaking total delight was that they made a record of that run. So you can pre a live record, you can pretty much hear what I heard for my first jazz show. Um, and I think it's available on YouTube, uh, Ron Carter and Jim Hall live at the Village West. And it was uh, recorded in November of 1982. And I came out of there and I was like, wow, this thing is deep. This well is deep and uh, whatever was going on here, I like it and I want more <laughs> of it. And that was really my, uh, my first exposure to it live. Uh, the next question that uh, rolled in here, this is a, a B question for how I got into jazz is um, what was the first jazz album that I purchased with my own money? Um, also 1982. Um, and I had a, uh, a roommate at a uh, boarding school um, who was a piano player, Mike Dumont. And uh, Mike just had a great ear, terrific player, and uh, just this amazing and expansive uh, musical uh, taste. And uh, he turned me on to Pat Metheny Group. And uh, I went out and purchased in uh, Wallingford, Connecticut, uh, Off Ramp. And um, there was something about the tune, Are You Going With Me?, that really hit me with emotional impact. It was like, I knew about the skill part and the depth part, but the direct emotion and right to my heart, there was something about that tune that just, just grabbed me. And um, I went on to purchase the live record where a number of the tracks from that uh, were recorded called Travels. And uh, I had that on my trusty Walkman as I uh, took a trip, a long train trip um, the next summer um, over uh, on the continent of Europe on my own just to go visit a friend. First time I've really been out in the world like on my own at the age of about 15 or 16. And I remember just um, rolling through uh, the coast um, of Italy, Cinque Terre, kind of that area, very hilly, beautiful Mediterranean. It's the first time I'd ever seen the Mediterranean and listening to the, uh, the chatter of the uh, train cars and then um, travels, you know, perfect. 
uh, on my journey. So that's kind of cemented for me in terms of uh, jazz composition and performance and that being a live record. Um, so like onto my, uh, my, my current projects, that's the number two um, sort of headline question here. Um, I've got a bunch. Um, I, I work as a uh, motion picture uh, film producer and writer. And currently I'm working on a um, couple of documentaries and also an adaptation of a book for the screen, which is the first um, book uh, that I've ever uh, been involved in optioning and then um, developing for uh, a cinematic treatment. Um, the first documentary project is called Kensu Maru, K-E-N-S-U-M-A-R-U, Kensu Maru. And speaking of music, it was actually through a musical connection that I connected with this director named Charles Hambleton, who was in a, uh, a terrific, uh, kind of not folk, but uh, rock, uh, alternative rock band called The Samples back in the 1980s, which were you know mainstays in Boulder, Colorado, where I went to school uh, from 85 to 90. And I ran into Charles here in the Bay Area. I live in the North Bay. But I ran into him, you know, uh, he lives in Sausalito, uh, coming down from Sonoma where I live and just reconnected with him. And he said, you know, um, I'm making a film. And I said, fantastic. He was a producer on the uh, Academy Award winning documentary on um, wildlife conservation. Very dramatic, very intense film called The Cove about the um, terrible dolphin, dolphin slaughter in Taji, uh, Japan. And um, he now has a uh, amazing treasure, treasure hunting documentary, which is all about General uh, Yamashita's gold. So um, it's going to uncover uh, a sunken treasure with a kind of modern Indiana Jones, uh, Chuck McDougall, um, who is returning to the Philippines after being gone for years and fleeing uh, the country during his uh, treasure hunting when he uh, made uh, President Marcos very upset. So um, that's the story of uncovering that. And there will be a huge um, social action component of that uh, called Gold for Good, where we return uh, some of the, hopefully, uh, the find um, to um, the Philippine people and other um, areas, or other cultures that were um, uh, involved in all of the, uh, the Japanese um, raiding of gold throughout uh, Asia from 1930 to 1940. So uh, that's Kensu Maru. And then um, uh, another uh, interesting project that I'm involved with is um, Visions of In the Fire, which is, uh, this is kind of a profile documentary of a, uh, a Clinket uh, indigenous artist um, in uh, Seattle, who is known for uh, their glasswork, Preston Singletary. And it's an investigation of his work um, as an artist and his inspirations. He has a, uh, an exhibit that just opened at the American uh, uh, Museum of the American Indian in uh, Washington, D.C. that's going to be there for a year. So if you're in the D.C. area and you're checking this out, please go check out uh, Preston Singletary's exhibition there. Um, he's an extraordinary glass uh, artist, uh, traditional slash contemporary glass artist. And uh, we're profiling uh, his work and his process. He's also a musician back to music and uh, um, has uh, a amazing band, uh, which is uh, based around uh, rock, funk, soul, and uh, Native American traditions called Kuik. Um, so he's a multi-dimensional artist and um, it's just been amazing sort of cataloging his achievements and delving deeper into his process and inspiration. So that's Visions in the Fire. And then the book uh, that I'm adapting is um, entitled The Last Stand, uh, which is very close to home. My family was involved with uh, the uh, lumber business. And uh, I uh, came across this book that my cousin gave me about 15 years ago. I read it and I was like, man, this, this story is fantastic, but the story's way too big. I don't have the chops as a producer at the age of whatever I was, 40 something, to attempt this because it's, it's a big film and it requires a lot of uh, CGI and and other things and large large scale staging. So I put it away. And then when I moved from Seattle uh, three years ago, I uh, was packing my books and I saw it there, The Last Stand, and I read it again. And I thought, ah, okay, I'm in my 50s now. This might be the time. And I said, what, well, let's see what the universe has in store for me to give me a thumbs up to advance on this. And 
I uh, looked up the writer and the writer lives 20 miles from me where I live now. And I'm like, Oh, that's a sign. So I went and had lunch with the writer and talked it all through and uh, we're able to uh, come to an agreement. And now we're developing the book. It's a story of um, one of the great American timber families, the Murphy family from uh, Humboldt County and uh, their family uh, timber company, Pacific Lumber, which was taken over by junk, junk bond traders in the uh, 1980s. Um, lots of musical possibilities there. It's a period film, you know, from about 80 to 85. So I'm really looking forward to um, that as that begins to come together slowly but surely. And uh, I'm starting a CBD company <laughs> on top of everything. And um, that's going to be a really interesting, uh, oh my gosh, the sun is absolutely blazing in here. Let's see if I can figure this out. Uh, wow. Well, we're just going to have something. All right, there we go. I think I approximated better. Um, who would have knew the light pouring in? Um, in any case, uh, let's see, I'm going to move this. Okay. I think that's better. And then, uh, working with CBD and, um, doing that in the context of a, uh, kind of a celebrity, uh, advocacy brand. And, uh, there'll be more about that coming. Um, so I'll be able to share that as, as we go launching, I think sometime in the second quarter. So I'm quite busy, but, um, Back to jazz. Um, the next question is uh, some advice you received from an older musician. Um, and what did they tell me? Well, I thought about it and right away the words rang in my mind's ear of uh, Wayne Shorter, who we interviewed for um, our four part series, Icons Among Us Jazz in the Present Tense, which I should have mentioned at the outset. And I think uh, Gail's going to be kind enough to put up a link to Quest TV. Uh, where you can find the series. Um, we got contacted by uh, um, the CEO of the company um, about a year and a half ago who said, yeah, I've heard about this series, love to uh, bring it over to Quest TV and we're able to um, make that happen. So the four part series, one hour each, which was produced almost uh, 10 years ago, um, is available there on Quest TV uh, for you to check out. And we talked to 83 artists over a period of almost eight or nine years um, we acquired 135 hours of interviews and 24 hours of filmed uh, performance on super 16 millimeter film, which I'm very proud of as a producer um, because it was difficult to put that together given the, uh, the expense and the difficulty in working with film. But that archive is, um, is amazing and the series is just terrific. We had a feature film version of it also that was picked up by um, uh, 2020 program, AFI, American Film Institute, and the film Travel the World uh, with the three, uh, one of the three directors or the three directors on and off and myself uh, presenting in, um, uh, at the Smithsonian, Washington, DC, about 10 years ago. And you can check it out there. I'm gonna kind of reposition myself here again due to the, the light pouring in. All right, let's see kind of opposite here. Okay, that's better. Now I got some backlight. Oh, this is great. Okay. Um, so that's uh, Icons Among Us, which you can check out here, uh, as mentioned on Quest TV. And then um, Wayne Shorter. Yeah, we talked to him. And Wayne basically said uh, to us, um, or posited, I should say, you know, perhaps there is no beginning and no end of anything. <laughs> And uh, boy, I'll tell you, the older I get, the more I appreciate that. So um, yeah, that was Wayne passing that on. And then another thing that I heard, and I'm just going to give a general attribution to a jazz musician somewhere, a male, female, old, young, I don't know who it was, but uh, they describing show business. And um, yeah, the sun just will not let me alone. Let's see if I can move here a bit. It moves, that's what it does. Okay, um, let's see. All right, we're just gonna go for it. And uh, that is simple. Um, in show business, nothing happens till something happens and then everything happens. And I've always loved that. And those are words of wisdom, especially when uh, nothing's happening. You know, I'm always thinking about what's gonna happen next and how everything will start happening when that, uh, that call comes in to advance. Um, 
so let's see, we're about halfway through and uh, I will um, pick up with some questions or some acknowledgements here in a little bit in the sidebar, uh, but I'll handle one more of these uh, questions to riff off of before I uh, uh, manage to uh, connect with the live audience. Um, how are you coping through the health crisis? Um, for, for me and for my wife, Kira, it's been pretty simple. We are fortunate in that we live in uh, Sonoma County here in California. So we have great access to uh, the coast and to forests, redwood forests. And um, they are just literally, you know, uh, a drive, quick drive away. And so we get out into nature consistently without fail. Um, basically every weekend, every other weekend, we're doing a trip and we're out there and uh, taking in all the benefits of uh, the air and um, and the uh, and forest and nature and all the good uh, good things that provides. Also grounding, um, I'm doing a lot too, which is simple. I just basically take off my shoes and I stand on the ground uh, for about 30 or 40 minutes whenever I can. I should probably do it daily, but uh, um, I need to put th that more into practice. But that has been really uh, helpful for me in terms of um, my energy. I feel like my body is not so much as when I lived in Seattle, but still bombarded with a lot of electromagnetic uh, energy. And God knows if you're a musician working around amplifiers and uh, other um, electronic instruments, mixing boards, um, audio suites, etc. You know, get out there and uh, kick off your shoes and ground out. Um, do that 30 or 40 minutes. And then the other thing that I'm doing is I'm just simply on a daily basis uh, addressing uh, natural immunity and without fail um, taking supplements that help to boost and protect my own uh, natural immunity through this. So um, it's been successful, been healthy, been well, um, a lot of gratitude for that and uh, just keep going on that front. So let's see uh, what's over here on the right side. Um, and see if there's any any other any questions here. Um, oh yeah, here's one a uh, question about who was interviewed in Icons Among Us. Well, Wayne Shorter was, Herbie Hancock was, Jason Moran was, Greg Osby was. Um, let's see, uh, Medeski, Martin, and Wood uh, were. John Schofield was. Uh, S. Bjorn Svensson trio was. Um, I think about some am other amazing people. Aaron Parks was. Uh, Terrence Blanchard most definitely was. Um, the list is pretty extraordinary. And um, we covered a lot of ground um, from all different uh, styles of, you know, everything from avant-garde um, per se. Um, you know, I think one of the things I learned in the process of making the series was Icons Among Us was simply that, um, you know, jazz is an extraordinary vessel. And uh, it really can... Um, uh, hold um, just about anything in terms of, um, you know, what's being created. And that, um, that creation uh, part of it uh, extends from, you know, um, R&B and funk and rock leanings all the way into free jazz, things that are um, more um, expressionistic in a pure form and experimental. And um, I love that and we love that. I remember working in particular with Matt Ship, and uh, such an outspoken and wonderful artist uh, that he is. Um, and then when we were um, in the post-production process, working with some of his solo piano, we, f or the, the colorist flipped a switch, which basically made the whole frame sort of a single tone, like a sepia sort of tone. And the moment we saw that, we, we stopped the colorist and we were like, just leave it that way. And that's one of the f moments in the film that our incredible editor, Christian Hill from LA, just, I mean, just extraordinary editor, um, put together and uh, we were able to retain in the film that gives uh, sort of, an, it matches the experimental quality of what you're hearing. So um, we love that too. And I love that too. And I, I'm sort of, uh, um, have a very open ear um, and just, you know, naturally uh, fortunate to really appreciate um, a lot of different forms of articulation of jazz. And I really, you know, I don't have uh, much difficulty with, uh, with any of them, including smooth jazz, occasionally, <laughs> ultra occasionally, occasionally. Um, 
So uh, let's see, let's dive into uh, a couple of more of the last questions and a few things I like to touch on while we have about 10 minutes left here. Um, let's see, um, any advice to give younger musicians uh, to keep them encouraged? Um, one of the things we addressed in Icons Among Us was this uh, mammoth um, canon of music that's behind every artist who enters the jazz art form. And at what point, if you choose, in learning uh, about that canon and playing those tunes and learning those tunes and uh, studying or getting on the bandstand with uh, players who have been educated by those generations from the past, that continuum, at what point do you turn in the forward direction and begin to really uh, pursue your vision? Um, that's a question. And that's a question uh, for the artist to make based on intuition and based upon, you know, their own um, timeline and disciplines. But um, I got a sense from talking to people that really like everybody who's, you know, both senior in this world right now and all the people who've left us, um, they're all rooting for you. Like for sure, like really. And I can tell you from the perspective of being a music aficionado and a, uh, an audience member in many, many uh, uh, concerts and occasions, listening as a listener um, and an observer as a filmmaker, meaning uh, observing with the camera or through audio observation um, through the recording process, that we're also rooting for you. The audience really, really wants the breakthrough to happen every time we enter the building. It's what we're hoping for. And uh, we're behind you 100%. So that's something I love to share with musicians. Um, rather than thinking that you're being critiqued, you're actually, uh, everybody's behind you, you know? Um, so there's that. And then uh, let's see, last thing, any darn thing I wanna talk about with the rest of the time? Well, there's, there's some things. So let's see what I can pull up from my, my, uh, my hat from uh, today's earlier uh, work on notes. Yeah, you know, there are some amazing um, pieces in our series that have, through time, have changed and become uh, more um, sort of prescient. And one in particular is there's only two folks in our entire series of 83 artists that we talk to um, that have passed on, which is, uh, we're very thankful and, and amazed at uh, in 10 years. And um, one of the musicians who just passed is a drummer named Montez Coleman. And Montez uh, is featured in the Roy Hargrove uh, Quintet um, in a uh, clip that I actually uh, posted uh, on my personal Facebook page, but I'll, I will see if I can share it with Gail too. Um, it's uh, one of our archive pieces in that there's only a segment, there are a few segments of it in the series, but this is the entire song basically, which we cut together. And um, Without fail, every time we showed uh, our feature length uh, piece in a theater, um, musicians in the audience would holler and shout when Montez um, got into the, uh, these really incredible runs uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the song. Um, and um, Roy also had passed. And they're also the only artists that um, basically we did not um, end up interviewing because the, the performance of the song, Invitation, was so strong that uh, there was just nothing else to say, man. Like, that was it, you know? That was the mic drop. And uh, I will share that full performance with Gail and hopefully she can uh, post that. And that was multi-camera film, motion picture film. And uh, it's beautiful um, in the way it unfolds. And uh, the other folks on the, uh, uh, on the uh, uh, piece, uh, or I should say the performance that night were um, Justin Robinson on alto, uh, Danton Bowler on bass, Gerald Clayton on piano. Man, Gerald just, oh, there's a solo there that is beautifully photographed by our cinematographer, Lars Larson, and then Roy on trumpet with Montez on drums. Um, so there's that. Um, some of the other people that I wish we'd had time or inclination. I mean, the, we talked to artists to find other artists. We really didn't talk to critics necessarily or to record labels or 
uh, publicists really talked from uh, to artists and they were the ones who recommended other artists in terms of how we curated the series. But there are some that we we didn't either get to because of scheduling difficulties or you know difficulties with management. You know, it was never really could never be because it's a documentary. It's never about money. It's more about um, sometimes uh, approvals of content, stuff like that. But um, there are a number of artists now in hindsight, just from the producer's perspective that I wish we could have uh, uh, included Charles Lloyd, probably at the top of that list. And um, Kyle Eastwood, whose music I've really come to uh, appreciate uh, uh, his skill and his nonstop touring in Europe. Um, Josh Redman, who we missed twice, really close in our European filming, almost almost put that together, but not quite. Um, Brantford Marsalis, um, we talked to his brother, um, but uh, didn't get a chance to speak with him. Um, promoter Danny Melnick, I wish I'd had a uh, chance to chat with uh, Danny Melnick, um, does such amazing work at uh, Carnegie Hall and uh, also at the Saratoga um, Jazz Festival. Um, and uh, Kenny Garrett, God, we're close on Kenny Garrett too, real close. Just couldn't work that out, um, unfortunately. And then, um, let's see, thinking about today, like what's happening right now and things that I'm excited about and that I'm listening to or it's coming across my my desk and um, I'm really, you know, getting uh, um, excited about. Um, one would be, um, or of many, oh, Dr. Lonnie Smith too, I can't forget him. Boy, I wish we had an opportunity to have talked with him. Uh, but currently Artemis, I love them. I saw them at uh, uh, Winter Jazz Fest back in 2019 and just the room was lit and uh, it was so wonderful. And Not Cohen is one of the artists we spoke with in Icons Among Us and um, She's part of Artemis, which is amazing. I think they have a new record coming out. Um, Theo um, Coker is just, you know, burning it up. I saw him at the, uh, oh, in LA um, uh, at a small uh, spot there. Um, and he just knocked my socks off. And I love, he's so visual. You know, he's got this kind of connection to uh, visual reality that uh, Christian Scott's got that too, you know, sort of riffing on Miles and, thinking about the visual part and how that connects to music. So I always appreciate uh, his, his visuals. Um, let's see, in terms of venues, um, there's a new venue that uh, my friend Daniel Atkinson um, is helping to shepherd along with others in San Diego called The Shell. And if you haven't looked up The Shell, like check it out online. I'm rarely like, you know, just freaking out about a new venue uh, outdoor in this case, but, um, uh, the shell is just amazing. So I can't wait to see a concert there when that gets going. They're always, Daniel's always putting on amazing things in and around the La Jolla and uh, San Diego area. But um, yeah, the shell. Um, and then other things that I've just been checking out in the moment. Um, you know, Christmas records, why not? I got alerted to um, uh, Nora Jones's Christmas record uh, with Brian Blade and Tony Cher and uh, Nick Movishan and Russ Paul and just love that. Um, and then one more thing before we uh, uh, we cut out here, because I got about, I think about a couple of minutes left, is um, I just saw this this uh, little rehearsal ditty by Christian Scott uh, Atunde um, Ajua from Dubai, uh, I guess for his album, Bark Out Thunder, Roar Out Lightning. It's on his Facebook page. And it's a rehearsal piece with him playing this instrument that I don't recognize. And man, it just blew me away. So that was something I saw like four hours ago that I thought I would share as an in the minute sort of uh, thing that got my attention. So I could go on about John Schofield at the Blue Note and, and uh, also um, uh, another favorite who we spoke to or connected with in icons, Gretchen Parlato is coming up at the Blue Note. I just love those guys. I wish I was in New York and I could check it out. But that's about it. Um, wrapping up um, tonight, I am on the board of uh, Earshot Jazz. So I've got to mention their concert tonight, um, which should be amazing um, with uh, the uh, Wolfgang uh, Moshpiel uh, trio, Scott Cauley and Brian Blade at 7 p.m. Pacific. Check that out, live stream. And then um, just the Jazz Bakery, we kind of offline. I'm on the board there for a long time since the health crisis, but we're getting it together. 
we'll be back presenting in LA and uh, I'm excited to be part of that too. So thanks to Gail and I got plenty of other things, but uh, hope you all enjoyed it and uh, take care and I'll see you around. Bye-bye.